Hey, everybody. Welcome to the AC Podcast. This is Steve. I'm here with Wes Huff. Hey, Steve. Hey. Uh, this seems to be happening a lot lately, you and me doing stuff together. I'm loving it. Uh, now, for our listeners, you probably have heard us mention this a number of times, but the next round of Apologetics Canada Literary Expedition, or ACLE, is coming up on Sunday, March 27th. Um, that's going to be four. That's going to start at 4 p.m. Pacific time, and uh, this time around we will be discussing George Orwell's famous work, 1984. And as part of that effort, uh, ACLE, uh, we have invited a guest with us today, all the way from Toronto, uh, Dr. Scott Masson. Uh, Wes, I'll let you introduce him. Yeah, so uh, Scott Masson lives here in Toronto with myself, and he's the uh, Associate Professor of English Literature at Tyndale University. And uh, one of the reasons we wanted to get him on this conversation is because the area of specialized specialization for Dr. Masson is classical education, hermeneutics, British and European romanticism, and uh, cultural apologetics. And so there are a number of areas that kind of cross over with this discussion and with commenting on not just George Orwell's 1984, but how we years like years later, decades later, after Orwell wrote, can still pull a, a lot of that out. And if I actually, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Masson, uh, my wife was your daughter's kindergarten teacher. That is correct. That's correct. So there's all sorts of crossover. <laughs> and in fact, when we got in touch with you, I was actually very happy to hear that you actually teach on 1984. Yeah. So I, I was very uh, interested in hearing hearing from you about this really what many people uh, consider to be a very relevant book right now in our cultural moment, especially with everything that's going on recently in Canada. So we'll get into all of that. Um, now, before we get into that, we at Apologetics Canada, we always try to take some time to make sure that you're not just a talking head or just a voice on the radio. Uh, we want to make sure that we take some time to humanize you in the eyes of the viewers and in the ears of the listeners. So without getting too philosophical, would you tell us who is Scott Masson? Uh, sure. <laughs> to humanize me, that's going to be hard work. Um, so... <laughs> <clears throat> so, yeah, I like uh, Wes said, I teach English uh, literature at Tyndale. I've been there for uh, 18 years now. Um, and I was born in London, Ontario. I'm status Mohawk. Interesting fact. Can't tell from looking at me, but it's obviously. So I grew up in London. I went to Huron College uh, in London and studied English and history. But I studied 1984 and Brave New World, which I'll mention alongside it, in 1984. So I'm going to date myself there a little bit. <laughs> so in grade 12, we read both of those books in, uh, in high school English. And I found 1984 uh, compelling. <clears throat> now you have to think about the backdrop for 1984. I assume that most of your audience is a little bit younger. It's not always the case. Uh, apologetics interest, but often 1984 was in the middle of the Cold War and really with an escalation of hostilities between uh, Ronald Reagan to our south and Mikhail Gorbachev over in the Soviet Union at the time. And um, very much it was a contrast, or at least so it was portrayed in the media between freedom and the totalitarian regimes of communist uh, Soviet Union at the time. And so it seemed very real. And uh, some of the ideas that were being floated there, you know, Big Brother and the Thought Police and Doublethink and Newspeak, uh, et cetera, were being presented to us. And uh, even more interesting, when I left Canada after my undergrad, I went and lived in Germany for, for three years and I studied German. I lived with a fellow who grew up behind the Iron Curtain and uh, right around that time. So this is early 1990s. Uh, the archives of the Stasi were opened and the way in which the surveillance state had 
operated was made plain to everyone. And the techniques that were used by the communists uh, were just as they're described here, very much of a regime of terror, but exercised through um, policing language and policing thought and, uh, and, and monitoring, surveilling everyone. So for me, it was powerful at the time. Um, I brought it back on the undergrad syllabus, first year English, uh, just a few years ago, because I realized that it's no longer being taught in schools the way it was when I was, and I thought it, it needed to be. Uh, and I thought it would be stimulating to conversations in the classroom. Yeah, thank you for but that's not about that. me, I guess about me. I don't know. I don't I can't humanize myself very well. Um, <laughs> okay, so <laughs> let me ask you a couple of questions. So I understand you have a couple of children. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm married and I have two children. You, you managed to touch on that. Um, so I have a, a, my eldest daughter is going on 12 and the son of seven. And uh, they're both getting a classical education, uh, which I thought uh, myself I would have liked to have had after I went to undergrad. Uh, I realized the deficits in my own education, and that was back in the 80s. And, um, and I thought if I had a choice to do otherwise with my own children, I'd try and do that. So I started the, the school at Westminster Classical. Uh, I was the founding board chairman there. Uh, and I was tasked to bring about a school that would offer that to to kids in Toronto, yeah. and uh, and it's done rather well. And uh, and there's a series of other classical Christian schools that have popped up in Ontario because of that, and, and elsewhere for that matter. So it's really imitating what's going on. At least it, it appears to be imitating what's going on south of the border. For me, it's a long term desire because I. I, I went to Germany. I studied classics there for that reason, really. So, yeah. I, I'm really glad you brought that up because uh, my wife and I, we just this school year, we started homeschooling because I always wanted to give my kids classical education. It's something that I never really grew up with. I went to you know your typical public school, and and the more I studied philosophy and theology, as I'm working with Andy and Wes, and um, I just realized how much more. I needed to learn and how deficient my training in the humanities were yep. and, and so on and so forth. So I, I wanted to kind of, I wanted to make sure that our kids didn't grow up with that kind of deficiency. And one really interesting fact, uh, my wife, her at her work, they were recruiting some interns and she said, uh, the best candidates were the ones that were classically trained. Like she could actually have an adult conversation with them, even though they were, you know, just straight out of high school and whatnot. So yep. that's what won her over. So um, yeah, if you ever have a, you know, have any inkling to start a classical school in the Edmonton area, I, I'd be all over that. Because <laughs> well, that that's why. Well, 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 we can talk about that later a little bit, but. You know, the, the interesting fact, and people ignore this, the Reformation was largely um, uh, in the backdrop of the Renaissance. These men were all classically trained, mm -hmm. whether it's Luther or Calvin or it's Fingley or Melanchthon or any, and, and the German's public school system was really established by Philip Melanchthon, who was a humanist. And obviously, there's a theological component that we're all aware of, but they had a had exactly that classical education. So did so did Wesley, for that matter. He, he would have learned to write Latin and Greek in school. I mean, just think about that. We we don't think about that. It's because things are available in translation. Um, yeah. But uh, but they wouldn't have regarded the languages as dispensable. Yeah, and that's... And, and and the works for that matter, right? But that's another topic, maybe. Yeah. That's John and Charles, not this Wesley. Um, I was, I was <laughs> yes. definitely not classically educated. Um, yeah. But we're th we're three for three, and and I uh, for a lot of the same reasons. I mean, my wife was homeschooled in classical education, and she just had a level up. And then to see her go on and then teach at Westminster, um, just the level of education that those kids were getting, particularly when I was studying the biblical languages. I thought, you know, if I had any grounding and foundation in learning Latin, learning Greek would have been a walk in the park. Um, and I, I just, I didn't have that. I was woefully unprepared for uh, studying 
theology and the biblical languages in terms of what I was was given because that there just wasn't the foundation laid there. Um, but going back to what we were uh, originally focusing on in terms of 1984, uh, Dr. Masson, why don't you tell us a little bit about Orwell? Where was he born? What was his upbringing like? And, and how did this contribute to his writings in particular? Okay, so his name was Eric Arthur Blair. It's a funny old name. Um, he was born in Bangladesh. Today's Bangladesh wasn't Bangladesh at the time, uh, but he was born there. And I think he stayed there till he was about eight years old. And then he was sent back like uh, many of his uh, ilk were because his uh, parents uh, served in India in some sort of minor, um, you know, official role. They sent their son back to England, to Eton College, which is the, the most prestigious uh, English public school. Pub the public schools in England are the, there are the elite pi private schools. And he, he studied there, and I'll mention one interesting fact about Eton College. He studied French under Aldous Huxley, who wrote Brave New World. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on because uh, Huxley responded to Orwell's publication of 1984, the really interesting letter. And uh, I'll, I'll maybe cite some passages from it because I think you'll, your readers will find it interesting. But um, yeah, he, he ended up going to uh, Oxford, I think it was, um, and, I, and studied French. Actually, I think he went to France. Pardon me. So after going to Eton, he went to France and then he just continued that. And he then worked as a war, wartime journalist, spent some time in Italy, uh, not Italy, Spain. Um, and he was very much a man of the left fighting against the fascism in uh, uh, Spain at the time. And eventually wrote uh, the two works that most people are best aware of, Animal Farm in 1945, published right at the end of the Second World War. And then this book, uh, 1984, that was published in 1949. Um, very interesting man, very much a committed man. Um, I'm not sure about his politics. Um, that's almost irrelevant. He, he it, uh, seems to appeal across boundaries, whether you're on the left or whether you're on the right, uh, people recognize his critique of the state as it grows in our era and it becomes almost more and more persuasive as time goes by as the state advances um, he also wrote one other book that's worth looking at um, if you want to dig down further the politics of the english language very interesting okay yeah um i i find it interesting that uh, just to let you know i i'm i grew up very much during the cold war and i oh, okay. am from south korea and so I grew up with very much this, um, a lot of concerns about what was happening just across the border. Right. And this tiny state called North Korea, how they were backed by these two, two um, communist giants, China on the one hand, and then the Soviet Union at the time on the other side. And I remember reading 1984 and thinking to myself, wow, like th this is a lot of this seemed really familiar to me uh what what little i knew about communism and things like that and but then i think you're right that's why i was a little confused when i found out that uh orwell was actually very much for at least in his early days he was very much for socialism um and I don't know if he was he was a proponent of communism, but he was certainly pushing back against fascism. And so I wonder if there's something, are we too facile in thinking that this is just kind of a linear spectrum where you have, you know, communism on the one hand, you know, fascism on the other, or, or is there something, should we think about it in a different way? Does that Boy, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I do think it's too facile. It, I mean, the common ground between communism and fascism is they're both totalitarian, right? They're both described as forms of totalitarianism. The communists are associated with the political left and the fascists are associated with the political right. Um, 
I've never really understand the association of the fascists with the political right, other than that they're opposed to the communists that are on the left, so therefore they put them at the right, right? But they call themselves socialists, like the Nazis are national socialists, right? So, and again, the, the left-right dichotomy, that goes back to the French Revolution and, and the party on the left, well, that's the third estate, those are the commoners. And uh, in the second, first estate, well, that's the church and the... Um, the nobility, the aristocrats are there. And, and so, and the, the, they tend to be socially, politically conservative. They want to hold on to things as they are the status quo. And so they're associated with the right because of that, but it's not really a political stance per se, uh, or, or, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, and I don't think it really applies anymore. And for Orwell's purposes, I think he's describing a, uh, the way the state operates in relation to the people under its under its uh, power, and you could see its application to a communist government just as easily as a fascist. So again, I that's how I see it. Yeah, you know, um, I, I think it's important to remind our listeners and viewers that again that this was published in 1949. So I think that time frame is really important because Orwell is writing on the heels of the Second World War and everything that he saw. Could you comment a little bit more on that? Yeah, so it's dystopian, right? It's a dystopian novel. It's it's a, presenting a view of the future that is not one that where it's better. You know, it's con it's contradicting the myth of progress. It's it's rather the opposite. Things are going to get much worse, and obviously fascism has been defeated at that point politically um, in Italy and, in, and in, in Germany. And so the obvious backdrop for it would be, would be communism. And I think he probably has that in, uh, in mind there. And it's not that he suddenly swung to the right. He's always been a man of the left. He's just concerned about the manifestations of the same things that he fought against when uh, he was in Spain, now emerging in the Soviet Union. Um, and so I think it is very much written against uh, Joseph Stalin in, in Russia at the time. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about 1984 proper, because uh, you okay. can help us kind of get into the world of 1984. Um, what, what the, can you kind of sort of set the stage for us, if you will? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so the stage is, again, it's futuristic. It's set in 1984. Uh, at that time, um, you know, that's looking into, well, how far in advance is that? It's 30-odd years, 35 years in the future. So it's not that far in the future. It is in the future, but it's conceivable. It's not something where you have to uh, imagine all sorts of futuristic technology and so forth. It's just the means of technology that are available at the time but under the guise of a state uh, that has developed and has uh, pretensions to control all areas of life. And the world is divided into various regions. And so they've gone beyond the nation state at that point, and you've fallen into blocks. And maybe that's you know, developing at his time in Eastern and a Western block. And it could be a critique of what could be happening in any of those uh, regions of power. It's how the elites use language uh, and really the emphasis in 1984 is on language. That's one of the chief marks of the totalitarian regime is how it politicizes the language, how it tries to cut out words it doesn't like, how it um, attacks the foundations of language, how it makes uh, nonsense sensible. So, you know, free, Winston Smith says, freedom is the ability to say two plus two equals four. In other words, to be rational. The response uh, from O'Brien is that actually, if the if the party says that it's two plus two is five, then that's what it is. And it's not just that he's saying that you have to say what we say; you have to believe that two plus two equals five. It's not just that you have to say it; you have to believe it. And and if they don't, if he doesn't do that, then they're going to condition him to believe it. And so there's a view, a certain view of language in there already as well which was becoming more and more common in uh, this period. And I will point it back to Martin Heidegger. So I'm gonna dig down here a little bit for you. 
Martin Heidegger is renowned in the 20th century for his so-called linguistic turn. And it's a view of language whereby uh, language uh, brings reality into being. It's that, that's what he believes language does. It, it are not just it points to it or articulates it or identifies reality. It gives the reality just by naming it. And this is a, as I say, called the linguistic turn. I'm not going to get down too deep into that, but that view that language uh, creates the reality underlies contemporary lit theories view of what language does and also of the state, what the state does in Orwell's day. It, we will tell you what the words mean and you will think that that's what the words mean. And the old uses of language will go down what um, Orwell calls the memory hole. You, and you'll forget about them. And you, you will never hear those words again. And we will erase history. We will control the, the telling of history. And this goes so far that um, even literature itself, by 2050, I think it says in the novel, we will get rid of memory of, of Shakespeare and Milton and uh, various other writers, we will simply destroy it. What was that? Where was this here in here? The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, they'll exist only in new speak editions, not merely change into something different, but actually change into something contradictory of what they used to be. So it's taking uh, language and literature and inverting its meaning to destroy uh, the rootedness of language in the past and in memory and connecting generations to one another. Now, if you can do that, you can break a culture and you can form it into a new image. So uh, we, just, we talked about classical education, which in a sense is just learning old languages, but there's more to it than that. It's becoming rooted in a culture out of which a certain type of people flourishes. In the case of the English speaking people, it's a a culture in which, uh, as our charter says, the sovereignty of God is recognized and the rule of law. That's, that's the culture in which English-speaking peoples have grown up. But if you change the literature and you, you invert the meaning, you can actually destroy that. I think that's been happening for several decades now. Well, and it's it's uh, the use of the idiosyncratic language, but the prov the provocation of the vocabulary, uh, like you said, Dr. Masson, in, in that quote, you you the word was used newspeak. Um, can you just go through some of those terms: in sock, old speak, new speak, double think? You know, why was this not only so important for the narrative of the book, but also for Orwell in communicating kind of a red flag? to the people that are reading it about what could then be uh, implemented and executed within societies? Uh, well, he invents words because it reflects the party's practice of inventing words, words that don't bear a correspondence to reality other than... So the, 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 the use of new terms and the terms uh, that Orwell uses are neologisms. They, they didn't exist before Orwell used them. So big brother... Double think, thought police, thought crime, new speak. Um, all of these words or phrases have passed into the English language to describe what people experience now, not just the, what they experienced in Orwell. And, and even the even Orwell's name, Orwellian, to describe a certain series of conditions under which we live. We and this is why you're talking to me about this novel. Um, so he creates those terms to describe a dystopia in which those terms at a time when those terms did not exist in the English language. Mm -hmm. But now they do exist in the English language and they do have a correspondence in reality, which is why people use them and they think that it's a commentary on today. And that I think that's fascinating. And it does describe the way in which neologisms are used in English all the time now. And my students say that language always evolves and of course that happens. And that's of course true, language does evolve. But it never uh, historically evolves in such a way that the words that are used are used to contradict common sense and logic and the laws of logic. And they do now, and they do so explicitly so that two plus two e could equal five. And you could talk about other applications of that same practice. So, you know, the gender transitioning or, or whatever you want, where, where something could be something else 
just overnight by fiat, by declaration, by use of language. That's a good point that words like, if we say the term big brother, we know what that means. Uh, Most people know what it means, what it refers to. Uh, What was the reception when Orwell originally published of this kind of idea, idea and concept within his own day and age? Well, it was well received. Uh, it was received quite rapturously, I should say, even. Um, and likewise, Animal Farm, Animal Farm even more so. Animal Farm was pushed um, at the end of the Second World War when it came out and, and used to describe communism, really. So it was used by um, uh, and promoted by uh, the West in a way to uh, warn about the the perils of communism and, and what happens there. 1984 doesn't do quite the same thing um, because it's talking more futuristically, explicitly so by setting a, a, a number on the date. And but it, it was well received and it it was you know uh, brought out in in film and so forth, including in 1984 a film came out version of it. But it's been uh, widely reprinted and it's it was used in syllabi in in high schools for decades. Um, because again, it was considered to be of contemporary relevance. It wasn't just, here's a novel and you might like it. And so, as I said at the outset, uh, when I found out that high schools were no longer teaching 1984, um, I thought I have to put it back on the syllabus because I don't think it's lost its relevance. Now, one of the something that I want to pick up on, which you mentioned earlier, is the use of language. But one of the things that I found in the book is that, like you mentioned, it's not just the language; it has some connection to the past. And one of the things that really stuck out at me is the passage where uh, O'Brien says that you know, if you control the past, you control the present, and if you control the present, you control the future. So, could you? Could you hash that out for our listeners and viewers a little bit more? What what is O'Brien getting at here? Uh, he's saying something that um, people are, I think, a little bit naive about in evangelical circles and Christian circles, even in um, society in general. They think that we can make compromises on the use of language and we can be vague in our terminology or even well, you know what I mean. You know, I said this, but I didn't mean that. And you know what I mean. I, 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 I said that, but I don't mean that. Precision in language for Orwell is a result of precision in thought because the two are connected for Orwell. Thinking and speaking go together, and they do. If you can't say certain things, then you can't think certain things. That's actually the effect of it. So if certain words become verboten, you can't use that word anymore. You can't use it in certain senses. What you are getting is the morality uh, of a people being dictated. And it's not being done on the basis of of logic or uh, an appeal to morality. It's just simply stated. It's dictated that it's wrong. You know, it's a, you know, unacceptable opinions. We're not going to allow that opinion to be articulated, however it's expressed. We don't agree with it. But this is how language itself works. Think about it theologically a little bit here. Um, God creates the whole of the world by his word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? And what we note about the account in Genesis is that God speaks. And when he speaks, he acts and brings what was not into being so that it is. And he differentiates the heaven from the earth, um, the, the waters from the lands, the male from the female, et cetera. So there's a differentiation that's going on, but it happens as a result of his word. The word in Hebrew is devar, which has connotations of, yes, word, uh, but also action. And so there's something really interesting about that, that fact, uh, that he creates ex nihilo by his word. And the fact that Adam and Eve are also said to be in his image, but the fir- one of the things that Adam does in Genesis 2.14 is he, he names the animals. And whatever he names them, that's what, it, it, that's what its name was, we read. So there's a power in that and an authority that comes with naming. Uh, and we know even in, in the Greek uh, rendering of this in John's gospel, um, we hear that uh, Jesus is the word of God. 
and that word for word is the logos now now logos in greek is a little different than devar in hebrew it has connotations of of word but also of reasoning a rationale uh, so that it's comprehensibility reality is comprehensible through language but it does, it is logical as well and so it is it submits to logic we can differentiate and we can also say that's illogical that makes no sense and so we're going to what is going to police our language is logic then think and compare and contrast that with the world of 1984 where language is used not to comport with logic or rationality but rather simply with what the party says reality henceforward is going to be and it explicitly then is going to contradict the view of language which reigns up until that point which is that of the greco-roman world and the christianization of it and the meaning of that tradition being uh, expressed through Christianity. That's what's happening here. And as a result of that use of language, people are dehumanized. And that's really interesting. So being forced to say things that contradict reality. So what is freedom? The ability to say two plus two equals four. And we think, well, why is he saying that? That's a strange thing. And it's because it, then it means something. It I can understand it. Whereas what the party says is simply what the party says. And even worse than the fact that I have to say what they say, I have to say is I have to think it. And that's what they're going to do. They're going to condition him. And they, that's what they do in, in part three of the novel. They bring him into the ministry of truth, <laughs> ironically named, where he is now going to uh, think what the party has broken him sadistically to think. Uh, speaking of which, I found that to be really interesting because in the book, they actually mentioned three different ministries. One is the ministry of love. The other is uh, ministry of truth. And then there was one other that I, which escapes my mind at the moment. But Me one too. of the things that I observed was that none of these ministries are actually about what the name implies like the, the ministry of truth is not about truth but they are and this is where i, I believe uh, winston is working is where he's constantly writing fiction to create the history that the party wants yes and here's the ministry of love but it's nothing about love it, except maybe that kind of um uh the the affection almost like a stockholm syndrome kind of a thing where he develops some kind of an affection for the big brother towards the end of the book sim just out of sheer coercion of it so um it, and then the ministry of peace which organized the war which is the ministry that's of right. war yeah and it was called the ministry of war in britain at the time by the way it wasn't the ministry of defense it was called the ministry of war so yeah yeah well okay, so, uh sorry if, go ahead if you could so if you could uh, comment, comment on that for us, that'd be great. Well, it's part of the inversion of language. It's not just that the party going forward is going to say that you will say what we say. What the party going forward will do is do the exact opposite of what has been established in language up till this point. They're going to use words so that they mean the opposite of what they had meant, not just something different but totally opposite to that. A great illustration of this double speak um, is the use of tolerance by our contemporaries. Uh, tolerance, and, and I've lectured on this in a public lecture on cult, cultural Marxism I don't know, seven or eight years ago now. Um, tolerance historically is associated with English speaking peoples. It's John, John Locke uh, uh, spoke of it and really promoted the idea of tolerance as a, a sort of willingness to allow disagreement on even the most fundamental things within the body politic uh, and let freedom to reign there more or less. And what he's talking about is in the context of the wars of religion between Catholics and Protestants, we will tolerate that sort of speech in public. That doesn't mean that he's saying that Roman Catholics would be allowed to hold public offices in England. He wasn't that, and it didn't happen. Uh, initially at that stage, you, you could not hold a public office as a Catholic, but you would be allowed to speak in public and you would be allowed to hold your, your understanding of the truth that way. It would fit with that. And so tolerance more or less for 300 years in the Anglosphere was the understanding of 
public debate. It was the context for the modern university. But in 1968, I think it might be 65, Herbert Marcuse brings out a book um, talking about tolerance. And he calls Locke's view of tolerance repressive tolerance. And he advances a new form of tolerance, which he calls liberating tolerance. And he basically says the purpose, the problem with, with, with uh, repressive tolerance is that it won't allow for the reality that I want to live in to be publicly acceptable. What, what is that? Well, it's the sexual revolution. Herbert Marcuse is, is promoting um, sexual practices that are not acceptable. He's, he's speaking against the uh, family. Um, he, is, he is one of the names that is being raised on banners or, uh, in, in Paris and in, down in um, uh, Berkeley and so forth. So it marks Mao Marcuse. It's, it's the sexual revolution. And he's saying that these sexual practices need to be normalized. And what is considered normal sexuality needs to be, needs to be considered perverted. And so that's the inversion that he's talking about. And we're going to do, through, do that through the word tolerance. So what was formerly tolerated is everything, except that you would not say that this was normal. We're going to normalize that, and we're going to consider um, what you hold to be the normal sexual practices, which, which would be monogamy and marriage, understood by political left and right, by the way, at that time, to be something which is deviant and oppressive and and uh, patriarchal and, and, and we need to liberate you from that. So we will go after the family through that. That's through that same word of tolerance. Very interesting illustration, I think. Yeah, and, and there's a very familiar ring to it in the sense of um, Michel Foucault, for example, some yep. of these postmodern deconstructionist thinkers who, again, wanted to kind of normalize whatever uh, any and all kind of sexual behavior. And they they did it by kind of tearing down or attempting to tear down the structures, social institutions. And I think a lot of young people today have bought into Michel Foucault's philosophies and Jacques Derrida and some of these postmodern thinkers. Is that, uh, is that a fair parallel or connection to make? 100%. Uh, uh, Michel Foucault is the most influential uh, writer thinker in uh, Western universities for the past 30 years. And he was he had communist sympathies, but really he's, you know, famous as a, as a, uh, as a gay activist and notorious, actually, uh, flagrant. He was the first French public figure to die of AIDS, but he was notoriously abusive of young boys and so forth. That's, that's only come out in recent years, I think, in his early days. But, but he, in, in many ways, uh, promoted um, the, the gay lifestyle that, that he lived and wanted to do so through not just uses of terminology, but through a re revision of history. That's what Foucault did and uh, wrote many books on that, you know, discipline and punish, punish the history of sexuality in, in various parts and so forth. And, and yes, he did all of that. So they're breaking the existing language and the logic that underlies it. Derrida calls it logocentrism. Interestingly, right? The centrism on the logos, we're going to break that and we're going to replace it with a different view of language. And it, it's going to, of course, open up all of the things that that history and that language has embedded as normalcy. And in fact, and not only do that, we're going to turn it around so that what was normal is now considered to be deviant and oppressive, even though if you look at the history of the church, Nothing has benefited women and children more than Christianity. Um, marriage uh, being and, and the state of matrimony being for life has benefited women like nothing else. And children uh, were seen as image bearers of God from the outset. I mean, children were rescued from uh, the street corners where they were left exposed to the elements and so forth. And again, uh, Christians open orphanages and they regard the widows and the orphans as a matter of their duty and care. I mean, I, I think this is just... This is just the history of the effect of Christianity on culture is it benefits women and children. You would never know that now. You would think that Christianity had done nothing but pull women around by the hair and step on them or like, like Orwell's boot on the human face. 
And that was one of the earliest critiques of the church was that it was the religion of slaves and women. Exactly. And why would anybody, why would anybody want to follow a, a, a religious group that, that benefits slaves and women? I mean, they're barely even humans. They are and human. So, in fact. They're not barely, they're not human. <laughs> yeah, right. No, they're that's, not. That's they, 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 have no, they, they have no, they have no value. The, 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 the father of the household can, can have them executed at a whim. There is no law mm-hmm. against it. Right. And, and even if you're born of that father, you don't become the father's heir until he adopts you as his son. So he can execute his, his firstborn at any point. There is no law against it in Rome. Um, now, bringing, bringing this back to 1984, again, um, I wonder if this is it's just something I picked up and I, and, and I want to know if this is something that perhaps Orwell is doing intentionally is um, Winston's relationship with Julia. So when I look at 1984, the whole thing is really bleak, but there are pockets of these moments of humanity, if you will. And what I found really interesting was that, whereas you know the whole thing is taking place in the city of London, but then there are you know with lots of almost like a concrete jungle kind of a feel, this really yeah. dirty industrial era kind of a feel. But then when he actually connects with Julia, um, and th- they have this this uh, passionate kind of encounter, they're found in the middle of this kind of a. They're surrounded by trees. There's life there. Do you think that was something that Owe was trying to get across to the readers, readers on purpose? Yeah, I mean, when you first read it, you wonder and sort of are cheering for Winston Smith, who is the hero, and Julia, and you, you're wanting to, and part of your, and part of the power of the novel is your hopes are raised by this. Like it seems a t- totalitarian. It seems like there's no possibility of escape. And yet this man is capable of thinking differently. And he finds little ways of hiding himself and and thinking for himself and doing things that are not allowed. And one of them is that he chooses uh, his own sexual partner because what that's what happens. And it seems like maybe he loves her and, and vice versa. He thinks so of uh, that she loves him as well. But what you find is that the attraction is more that they are allowed to pursue their own sexual desires uh, without any authority above them. And that's more or less it. It, it is very much uh, not in the romantic love tradition. There isn't any sense of till death do us part. There's more of a sense of we're going to do this because it's forbidden. And that's the delight in it. It's just that it's forbidden and we're going to therefore defy it. And they enjoy the defiance. It's an act of defiance. So it, it's not nearly at first, you're hoping that there's, there's a little bit more to it than that, but there isn't really much more to it than that. It really is more that it, it tastes better because it's forbidden. Um, and, and, and there's no sense, there's no sense on Orwell's part. I don't think that uh, the act is sinful per se although forbidden fruit and all that, you would think that, that he might go there, but he doesn't go there. But he also doesn't get, give us the sense that there's anything romantic there. It's just that it's, it's an act of freedom because it defies the totalitarian edicts of the state. And that's it, really. But you're right, Steve, when, when I first read it and I reread it, I think you want to see more to it than that. And there, it's just really not there. That's my yeah, sense. I, yeah, I, I do remember... Uh, where Orwell writes, you know, in the voice of, I think, Winston, maybe in his thoughts that this lovemaking that they do, Winston and Julia, between the two of them, that it was a political act. Yes. Um, and, because this was basically sticking to the man, so to speak. Um, <laughs> or the, yeah. Ouch. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's an unfortunate phrase. But yes, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, no pun intended. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> But um, but on the other hand, he describes his love life, if you could call it that. It's more of a kind of a mar- mechanical marriage life. But Winston actually has a wife. But he, he uh, the way it's described, his love making with her isn't there is no love at all. Here is a woman who is completely brainwashed by the party, and she views this process of, of having sex 
simply as a civic duty uh, yeah. because because we need to produce children for the party everything is for the party yeah and in all of this what i find is this kind of there's a real tension i find between sort of this total surveillance where everything is being watched if you will and everything is for the party versus privacy the preciousness of privacy and and something that is for myself and not just for the party that that tension there um so i i for example when uh winston and julia find um the this room that they're renting to spend time together uh, one of the things that's really strike, striking about this room is that it's quiet, uh, yeah. whereas everywhere else there's propaganda all the time. There's all seems to be a lot of noise. Is that yeah? Is they've that, got the uh, screens on the walls everywhere as well, right? And not there, right? Yeah. It, yeah. It's not just uh, screens to show you things too. Like it's it's it, the the party can actually surveil people. They through can the, yeah. watch and listen to people through these things, so. Okay. Which none of us can relate to whatsoever right now, right? No, no. <laughs> yeah. What are you talking about? Especially, especially in the age of... I don't know, but let me cover my phone while I say it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, could you comment on that that tension, though? Uh, you know, constant totalitarian surveillance versus privacy. Is this it, Does this have to be, like, completely one or the other? Is there a healthy balance? Like, what what's your take on that and what's you know what's your take on it through the lens of sort of 1984 if you will does that question make sense sure through the lens of 1984 um it's really got that bad that it it that the sexual act is just a is just more or less a political act so in a sense they're already lost there's nothing left that's good anymore if if all this is is a political act then it really isn't a recovery of, of the realm of intimacy. You know, it, it's an act that happens privately, but it suffers the dep deprivation of the total politicization, politicization of life, even there. So even when they're on their own and there's nobody else around in the room where there is no surveillance monitors, he understands it as a political act. So at that point, I think the party already controls him anyway. There is no realm in which the, he doesn't think the state's already involved, and even that's an act of defiance against the state. So he's not doing anything good in and of itself. He's just in his action towards uh, the woman is simply for that reason. And it seems like vice versa as well. And I would have thought that it reflects how bad things have got there, because if you think about it, um, intimacy in human terms is in general done in private. And we want pri privacy for that. I mean, people that have sex outdoors and so forth, there's something animalistic about that and something that's dehumanizing about it even. Um, and that is not because uh, we're ashamed per se, but it's that there's something that is intensely personal that needs to be protected and, and shielded from the world. And there's something that is uh, there that the public square should not be involved in. So there's a difference between the public and the private square. And that sense of the private square uh, and the private sphere of life, that, that which is that of the family and domesticity has been invaded so far at, at the time of 1984 that there's there really is nothing left. And it's illustrated in the two ways. In the one, that his own wife is probably spying on him and everybody is worried about this because children are taught to spy on their parents and, you know, fess them up or rat on them or however you want to put it and, and spouses. And again, this happened in East Germany in the Stasi archives. They found exactly that, that relatives had been informing on one another. They thought these Germans thought that the people that were informing on them were the Stasi, the secret police that were everywhere. They didn't have that many secret police. It was their own families that were informing on. That's what the archive showed. And that's what ha is happening in this world. So the, on the one hand, there's that. But even when they do find a private moment and private place, they still uh, have deprived privacy of intimacy. There's no intimacy left. It's a brutal world. And it reflects the... Now, here's the critique. I, I want to get to this because I, I don't know how much time we have. The critique or the reception from Aldous Huxley he said the uh, the first 
fruits. Now I'm just going to read it. The first hints of a philosophy of the ultimate revolution, the revolution which lies beyond politics and economics, and which aims at total subversion of the individual's psychology and physiology are to be found in the Marquis de Sade, who regarded himself as the continuator, the consummator of Robespierre and Babeuf. Mm. The philosophy of the ruling minority in 1984 is a sadism which has been carried to its logical conclusion by going beyond sex and denying it. And then it gets the boot in the face. But even their own sense of sexuality, they're sadistic. So there's an element of sadism in, and, and power for power's sake in Orwell, which you don't see in, say, all this Huxley's work. Because he says this is a little bit too crass and it's a little bit too hard to impose this sort of reality. This is, this is Huxley's response to Orwell. He says, I think my view of the future is more realistic than yours, because this is hardcore uh, boot in your face type stuff. Mine is more, we're going to seduce you through soma and you know make sex pleasurable and decouple it from marriage and all that sort of thing. I think if you combine the two, you get a pretty close approximation of what happens after the period. Although arguably we point more to 1984 than we do Brave New World for a lot of sort of our, our societal ills and things we're worried about. Although, you know, Brave New World right. definitely plays in the discussion. No, you're right. You're right. We do. We do point to 1984 as the horror scenario, but that's because the state becomes outright violent then. And mm. one of the reasons we, we aren't worried about all this Huxley is because we actually accept that and don't see the horror of Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. It's not because it doesn't come about. If you read it, you will find there are so many things about it that have come about, uh, conditioning, eugenics, etc., cetera, uh, and have become publicly acceptable that um, you just shrug your shoulder and say, what's so bad about that? Whereas 1984 still seems like a horror scenario. I think Huxley or, or all, yeah, Huxley thought that uh, his brave new world was a horror scenario. It's just, we don't share when I say we, we don't think it's as terrible as, uh, as uh, Orwell's. I think they're both impossibly terrible. They're both intended as a view of the future, which is so terrible that we ought to be blanching at the horror. And when we read Aldous Huxley, we mostly say it's not quite so bad as Orwell's. <laughs> mm. And maybe that's because the sexual revolution is pushed in Huxley's version in a way that we have not objected to, whereas Orwell still makes us uncomfortable and squeamish because people go to prison there and so forth. We're in, we're, we're in, we're in, uh, Huxley's world, they just get sent into a colony where, you know, the unmentionable, untouchable mm. people go, they put them with the barbarians and so forth, but they don't imprison them and they don't recondition their minds so that they have to think what the party says. It's just more of a, a prison state we get in, in uh, yeah. Orwell. Yeah. Well, this conversation is just fascinating. I'd love to keep going, but we are coming to the end of our time together. Um, before we wrap up, though, I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell our listeners and viewers if there is any sort of, if there is one thing that you want them to take away from 1984, uh, what would that be for you? Oh, wow. One thing to take away from 1984. Uh, language matters, and it matters to the point where this is a line that you must not give up, right? Everyone has their line in the sand. The line around language is one which will turn the ship in whatever direction uh, people want it to be turned, and it will be turned either to honor Christ or it will be turned to dishonor him. And that's partly because of the nature of reality. It's also partly because of the nature of God. And it's partly because of our nature. Words matter to us. We use words to understand reality. If we use words that don't comport with reality and they become characteristic of our life and they contradict God's words, then we are going to live in a dystopia. That is what happens. That happens in these novels. We've already said that Orwell 
uh, uses language in such a way that we use his terminology as if it described what was going on around us. So we might want to think about that. Uh, Dr. Masson, um, if our listeners want to know more about you and the work that you do, where where could they find that? So I had a series of podcasts um, out with a friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Friesen, called Paideia Today, with the Greek spelling of Paideia, uh, P-A-I-D-E-I-A, today.com. They're there. Um, they're also on my YouTube ch- channel, which I've got lots of public lectures there for my classes. Um, I'm also working with an international Christian consortium on bringing education globally, uh, classical Christian education, uh, to a global audience through technology. And it's called the Third Education Revolution. And uh, you might want to look that up. It's with uh, Vishal Mangalwadi, who's an Indian apologist, um, public intellectual, and so forth. Very interesting project. And I think um, if education is um, and how people understand themselves and think about the past and think about the future is the way in which we uh, will glorify God, uh, then doing this in a way that will reach people around the globe, and you can do it through technology uh, these days, so you can bring good Christian education to people in their in their in the privacy of their homes then I really think that this is the way of, of the future in, in many ways. Uh, public education, we talked about this at the outset, has really gone not just off the boil, it's really lost the plot. Um, I do think the recovery of education and Christian education is of a, a vital necessity in our day. So yeah, do look at that. Sounds great. It has been a tremendous pleasure speaking with you, Dr. Masson. I don't want to make you commit to anything, but oh, I sure hope that we get to do this again sometime, perhaps on, on a different work written by a different author. But thank you so much for making some time out of your busy, busy schedule to speak to our listeners and viewers. We really, really appreciate it. It was my great pleasure. And uh, yeah, I look forward to that. Let's do that again sometime. Great. Thank you, listeners and viewers, for joining us for this week's edition of the AC Podcast. The AC Podcast is a ministry of Apologetics Canada, and we will come back next week with more stuff to think about. Until then, love God and love people.